Hey, this is Bobby Hunt 3 with bluelightdiet.com. And uh, today I am very excited. I've got um, Dr. Jacob Lieberman with me for a, a, a fun interview. He, um, he's written my favorite book on light. It's called Light Medicine of the Future. And this thing is, is 30 years old, I think. We're just getting up there. And then he's also written luminous life and i think he's got two other books um one on wisdom and one on um uh, a vision yeah. and, and also i i gotta remember to ask you about this uh he he sells a really cool product on his website it's a spectral receptivity system and it's a it, it's a it's a it's a glasses a kind of a color therapy system that i'd love to chat about but anyways doctor thank you very much for um coming on today. Yeah, you, you had asked me about uh, my association with John Ott. I met John Ott, I think in either 1974 or 75, he was speaking at a conference in Miami. And he was talking about things that I had never considered. Here I was trained in vision and of course vision cannot function without light but never had any training in light <laughs> huh. and here john ott is talking about the fact that all of our light sources in our homes and offices and so on are drastically different from sunlight and just as if we ate a diet that was out of balance, we might experience malnutrition. What he was finding is when what we're ingesting is imbalanced light, light that does not contain all the energies that the sun provides naturally, then we end up will with mal illumination. Now you say, what the heck is mal illumination? <laughs> and back then, he was showing that one, plants did not grow normally if you modified the source of light. And with every different modification, you impacted the plant differently. With one modification, the leaves might only be dwarfed in relation to their normal growth size. <clears throat> With another modification, the plant might never flower or might never create a vegetable or it may not grow to full size. Uh, that same work with John was working on in the 50s and 60s, was done with animals in the 20s by a, a man named Harry Riley Spittler. And he found that when he took rabbits all from the same family and placed them in living environments where they all got exactly the same kind of food, the same amount of food and everything. And the only thing was different was the lighted environment that they were living under he noticed that some of the rabbits grew much larger than normal. Some of them never got even to the minimal normal size. Some of them, their bones grew excessively large. Some of them were chronically constipated. Some of them had chronic diarrhea. Some of them developed cataracts. So, some of them had no, no hair. Some of them had very long hair. And what he discovered from this is that every function of the body is light dependent. And Ott discovered something similar in relation to plants initially. Then he found that the wrong kind of light could cause tumors to grow much quicker, could allow you to live longer or to live shorter. And so he was the modern day pioneer that gave us uh, the knowledge 
that the sun was the most potent environmental factor we had and that, <clears throat> and that we needed it for optimal health. And so I met John, we befriended each other because I was practicing in Miami, Florida and he lived uh, <clears throat> on the west coast of Florida. I used to go up and visit him. I would sleep in his apartment at different times just to, to gain knowledge from him about his work and what, and his insights and his discoveries. And uh, a lot of my education, because back then we didn't have the internet and unless you had medical libraries that, where you could find certain things, all you could do is try to find the sources. And so he was, I would go there and I would befriend them. And so one of my other uh, mentors was a man named Dr. Fritz Holvich. He had three doctorates. Okay, so you have the book. <clears throat> and so Fritz and I were dear friends. I traveled to Germany at his invitation and stayed in his little town. And we spent days talking and he wrote me beautiful endorsement for my PhD thesis. And so for me, finding out what was going on wasn't just about reading papers, but it was going to the source, finding out who this person was in real time, how they lived their life, and to gain whatever I could from their direct experience. And so the things that I speak about today and have always spoken about are things that were catalyzed by my own personal epiphanies. My, they were a result of my own direct experimentation. Uh, so whenever I, something is, enters my awareness that is really exciting, I go there to find out what is that. Mm -hmm. And then I work with it on my own to see what is my direct experience with this before I introduce this to other people and then begin to assess over time, not based on someone else's theory, but based on my own empirical investigation to find out what the truth is beyond the opinions. Gotcha. Very cool. So Otten Hallowich, um, and for those of you who don't know, this is, this is the John Ott book, uh, Health and Light. So they, you kind of took their, um, uh, their knowledge and then uh, applied your own knowledge to that and then turned it into this Light and Health book here. Well, what happened for me is that I had experiences with light before I met John Ott, but in a different way using what at the time I would call colored light um, and noticed an impact from it. And so they brought to my attention a different facet of light. Holvich discovered in the year of my birth, 1947, that the stimulatory and regulatory impact that light has a, upon the body was primarily occurring by way of the eyes. Yeah. Now we have to expand upon that because when I said the eyes, you did that, meaning the eyes in our head. But we have about a hundred trillion cells in the body and what we now know is they all have eyes. And those eyes, like the eyes in our head, are designed to detect and respond to single photons of light, which means that the seeing mechanism exists everywhere in the body, like a hologram, and it responds to an invisible energy 
that guides the functioning of the cells. And so our cellular activities, what the cells do, when they do it, to what degree, is inseparable from what is occurring in the environment that we are part of, having to do with light, darkness, spectral characteristics, um, time of day, time of season, place geographically, and so on. All these things are impacting us all the time, and they're inseparable from our ingestion of light, where my work took me in the late 70s was one of the questions I used to say to John Ott is if being in the sunshine was all we needed for optimal health, how come people like farmers and so on that spend all day in the sun still get sick? And he couldn't quite answer that question. And what came to me, what, what my revelation was in the late 70s was some people can take a supplement of vitamin C but not absorb any of it. Their body doesn't have a receptivity to it. So it goes in their mouth and then it's excreted through the urine or their bowel movement but they haven't assimilated it. The same thing happens in our life. We can be in the sun. However, our body's ability to actually ingest, digest, assimilate, and excrete all the different wavelengths that are available to us, that's different from person to person. And so one of my discoveries was that the optimal health, the awakening, the enlightenment, whatever you wish to call it, has to do with our being, being able to embrace all of the energies that comprise the spectrum of light what, that is important to our health, but it's also important to our awakening as human beings because the energy we call light, which we perceive as brightness and which we perceive as color, those are the vibrational foundations of what we call our life experiences. The experiences we have in life, which we say are matter, they, they have a form, the, the very renowned theoretical physicist David Bohm, <coughs> who Einstein called his spiritual son, made a profound statement all matter is frozen light. And of course, Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared, <clears throat> basically says that light can exist as energy or it can exist as matter. They can go back and forth. So what we call our experiences are the formed expression of the formless energy called light. And so over the years, <coughs> what I've come to see is that the colors we're comfortable with are directly related to life experiences that we feel at ease with. And the colors that we are uncomfortable with represent aspects of our life that we're yet not able to fully embrace. And why that is important is that enlightenment, which is a term used in, often in, in spiritual contexts, 
a certain awakening has to do with unconditional acceptance. It has to do with an ability to embrace what is rather than to embrace what I like and recoil from what I don't like. What we know about cellular function is this. When a cell is in optimal health, it responds to all wavelengths or what we perceive as color, responds to all of them identically. But when a cell is out of balance, it responds selectively, effectively saying, I like the red, but I don't like the blue or vice versa. So receiving the full spectrum of energy that we call light, what we say is visible, is exceedingly important to one's health, continual development, and also evolvement in terms of their awareness as a portion of their humanity. Gotcha. And I think uh, that is in, in light medicine, that's one of the things you brought up uh, kind of that that um, that uh, goes beyond what I, I I focus on. I focus on like the kind of the mechanics of it, how it works with photoreceptors in your in your skin and in your eyes and everything. And what I really liked about your books that I've ignored or just didn't have a clue about was the color therapy, the what you were just talking about there, and how um, certain people or people are are deficient, like the, the light tank um, theory or, or whatever. They, right. you, certain people are deficient in certain types of light. Right. And I think that's where uh, your, in order to fix that for each person, each person is unique and your glasses, those spectral receptivity glasses, is that how somebody would go about solving that issue or figuring it out? Um, rather than thinking of it as fixing or, re or solving, uh -huh. let's call it a process of discovery. Um, so yes, uh, over the years, I've developed many different devices that were used for that purpose. So people would purchase a device or use it with their clients or I used to teach therapists how to use this approach. That was the syntonics? Well, syntonics was even before that. Even before that, okay. But at a certain point, I discovered that everything has value. It just depends where you're looking at it from. Uh, one person can um, see um, a piece of wood with something on the end that's softer, like a broom to clean the floor. And another person can see that same piece of wood with something on the end as a paintbrush and make an incredible piece of art. Um, Syntonics is based on a model developed in the 20s and 30s by a, a Dr. Harry Riley Spittler, very valuable work and introduced me to utilizing light via the eyes. But it's a, it's a more physiological model and it attributes certain effects to certain wavelengths. So, for instance, <clears throat> turquoise, which in syntonics language is called mu upsilon, was something they used as an anti-inflammatory. Well, to put uh, an intrinsic meaning or value on something like that is like saying, Everyone who eats an apple will have a similar effect. But we know that's not the, tr the case. Mm -hmm. Everyone that meets a certain person will like them. We know that's not the case. 
that the impact of anything is based on the relational dynamic between whatever that is and in this case, an individual. So I started noticing that while syntonics was incredibly valuable and gave me a beautiful start and was very valuable in terms of using it to deal with certain visual difficulties or visual patterns, my real interest wasn't about changing the eyes. Is It was about allowing someone to experience or to uncover their full potential, their potential as a human being. And so syntonics was a launching pad for the approach that later became, uh, became inseparable <coughs> from the three or four different light therapy units that I developed. But all these units were, you know, thousands of dollars and expensive and so on. And so many people were impacted by this. And I realized that so many people could benefit from this in the comforts of their own home that I eventually evolved that system, which was called the spectral receptivity system. Um, to a home-based kit that was made up of 13 simple pairs of glasses that are custom made for me in Belgium. And they have specific filters that I have designed and spectrographically analyzed. And people don't use one filter versus another. They utilize all of them and they utilize them in a special way. In syntonics, the treatments are for 20 minutes. I don't know what's special about 20 minutes, but 20 minutes. When I started working with light, I often found that looking at a color that you were not receptive to for a half a second could be overwhelming. Yeah. You would never give them 20 minutes. It would just push someone over the edge. But what I discovered in my work and my years of working with thousands of people is that when we feel stressed, when we start worrying too much, we call it thinking, but most of the time it's worrying. When we're working at things, something occurs that changes our entire physiology. We call it stress. But the, probably the, one of the first things that occurs in the cascade we call stress is that the cycle of expansion and contraction that occurs in the body and in the universe, but in the body we call it breathing. And that gives us the impression that we are breathing. In actuality, something is breathing us. Something inflates us and deflates us, and it occurs at a certain rhythm, which is a rhythm that is part of the universe. We are being entrained. I call them, I call it like the rhythm of wellness. And it entrains our system. Well, what I notice is that when we're working at things, when we're stressed, when we're trying hard, when we're thinking too hard, that collapses. The breathing becomes shallow. It becomes clavicular breathing, upper chest breathing, or the breathing is held. Well, every time the breathing stops, every aspect of our humanity starts to decline. That's why we end up eventually dying if we don't have breath. But the moment it stops, the decline begins. And so I started noticing that anything that impacts the breathing cycle in a way that causes it to constrict 
is something that we're having a little bit of an allergic reaction to. Whether that's a person in life, our ex-lover or ex-husband or wife or an employer or someone that we said didn't treat us properly, or whether it's a piece of music that we just are uncomfortable with, or a color on a wall that doesn't feel good. And so what I started noticing is that when people looked at, visualized, or just even imagined colors, they had very different somatic and psycho-emotional responses to it. Some colors just ah, would just ease their breathing. Some of them cause them to hold their breath. So the way I've designed this kit is all based on that. So when someone puts the glasses on, it isn't, oh, you're going to wear these for five minutes. You put it on and you just notice what it does to the breathing. If it facilitates the breathing, you'll be able to keep them on a little longer. If it causes the breathing to collapse, it's something that you'll want to remove. So you honor what your body is sharing with you. And so what happens is each week, a person goes through the use of all of these glasses, uh, noticing how each one impacts them. Is it comfortable? Is it uncomfortable? How does it feel with this on? And then what happens after I remove them? Because once something gets triggered, it may begin to surface. And all of a sudden it gives you a sense of why this color might be uncomfortable. Very often people look at a color and they'll have a flashback of an event that was life changing for them. So I utilize this kit not to fix, not because anything is wrong. Our systems are miraculous and they adapt to life in different ways depending on what we need. If something occurs that shocks our system, our system naturally recoils. Mm -hmm. So if you, maybe you remember as a child, maybe you went to a, a movie on a Saturday and it was a little bit of a scary movie and something came up and all of a sudden your knees got pulled up to your chest in the chair and you covered your eyes. Cause you just did, you couldn't take that in. And then when you felt a little bit more at ease, you started peeking through your fingers to just allow in just enough that wasn't going to feel overwhelming. Well, that is essentially what goes on in all of us during the day, whether we're pulling our knees to our chest or covering our eyes. When we experience something that we are unreceptive to, that, that for whatever reason we're yet not able to embrace, our body creates a protective mechanism, we call it a compensation, to protect us, to support us until a time comes when we are potentially ready to integrate this. And so maybe at some point later in life, we re-experience this. In fact, most of the things that are traumatic in people's lives, they will experience them over and over again, each time seeing them a little differently. Most of the traumas in our life, even though we speak of them as childhood traumas and things that happen early in life, most of those traumas have been passed on from one generation to the next we will probably never know the source of the wormhole that all of us individually go to when some sensitive part of our humanity is touched. Mm -hmm. And so I use color as a way of illuminating 
some aspect of our makeup that is ready to be looked at maybe with a larger perspective or a greater field of vision. And you don't do, nothing is done by pushing or confronting. Everything is done by invitation only. So it's a very gradual process. And what people find is as they go through this protocol that I've, that has evolved over the last, I don't know, more than 40 years I've been doing this, is now it's sort of set up like a 28 day, like a four week process, which can be revisited over and over again. But people find that they become more comfortable with the colors that used to feel uncomfortable. And when that occurs, they become more at ease with aspects of their life that used to trigger distress. In other words, the aspects of our life that we have some sort of an allergic reaction to so that when we encounter them, our state of ease is immediately transformed into a state of dis-ease. And so I use this system as a way of helping people to become totally and cellularly more receptive to all the different wavelengths of energy that comprise the spectrum of light and are inseparable from the spectrum of life. And so there is an experience that shifts their health and their outlook and their way of seeing and their overall state of, of well-being. And uh, so this is what that, how that kit is used and it's designed for the everyday person to use uh, at home. That is very cool. So I, th I think you said certain people are receptive to certain colors and then they push away or other colors can make them stressed or right. like that. So with that in mind, could the paint on your bedroom walls be a secret source, like a, a yes. stress for some? Yes, absolutely. Like they could be freaking out and have no clue it's the paint in their bedroom walls that are making them do that. Well, usually when people enter a room that's painted a certain color, uh -huh. they usually feel comfortable or uncomfortable. Right away. So yeah, they, they know something is off. They may not know what it is, Mm -hmm. but they know something is off. And so usually th at some point, they'll want to they'll want to experiment with a different swatch of paint huh. on the walls it, or a different it, kind of light in the ceiling. With your spectral receptivity system, would is that also a way for someone to tell what colors make them un uncomfortable? Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, the one of the things that I do is I, I mentor a, a, a very small number of individuals and um, which I do on one-on-one -on -one work and I take them through this work. <clears throat> um, when we're initially evaluating this and they don't have a kit yet, we're just doing a consultation to see, you know, am I the right person to support them? Which, which is the most critical piece of, of any relationship. And so I will take them through a simple visualization that allows them to experience what we're talking about without ever putting a pair of glasses on their yeah. eyes. So you can visualize it and literally get an incredible clue to what's going on. Everyone knows that there's certain colors they're at ease with. They're my favorite colors. Why are mm. they my favorite? Because others are less favorite. Mm. And so the less favorite ones are really uh, important to know what those are because, you know, our body, uh, Western medicine has a certain way of looking at it, but ancient literature, thousands of years old, 
speaks about a system of chakras, a system of energy centers, seven primary energy centers, each one associated with specific endocrine glands. Each one is a, an energy vortex, it would be described. And what I always found interesting is that they're assigned certain colors, colors of the rainbow, the red being the base chakra, and then the violet being the top of the head. Now, I could never find any literature why that was. But when I began experimenting in the late 70s, something astounded me. The people that really had difficulty with red and orange would routinely tell me they had lower back pain or had problems with their feet or their knees or had reproductive issues or had you know, genital herpes or whatever. It was that if the color associated with that chakra was something they were uh, unreceptive to, it was almost as though that part of the body was left in the dark. Just like putting a plant in a closet, it doesn't develop or it develops abnormally. So I started seeing over the years a very significant correlation and relationship between the colors we're receptive to in the parts of our areas of our body where we develop problems. Huh. And so what's interesting is, you know, so much light enters our eyes, uh, but we know that the endocrine system is entrained from the pineal on down, pineal, pituitary, thyroid, thymus, and so on, it actually follows the same system as the chakras. So there's probably some science that will come to bear at some point that will allow us to see that what people um, discovered through direct experience or intuition or mystical vision is actually similar to what people are discovering by doing scientific uh, science, research, studies, looking through microscopes, telescopes, and so on. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I think it was Ott's book. He did a study, it was with mice at first, but then I think he, he, he applied it to prisoners and uh it was the color pink and he that wasn't odd but there was, was someone not... else uh, that work uh was done by um his name his first name is harry uh i believe he's canadian he i think he's passed away now um i can't think of his last name but i believe that he was the person that did that work in the penitentiaries where they painted the walls pink pink and it, it calmed people down it, it calmed people down but then there was kind of a i i want to say maybe i get this wrong but i want to say there was a duality to the color so for a short period of time it calmed people down but then if you left them in a room 24 hours with pink walls it would make them crazy right um simulating stress hormones or what whatever right right um so I, I wonder what your, your, with that in mind, what do you think about, so a lot of people now, they wear blue light blocking glasses at night. It, and, and the glasses are all colored. So these are a dark orange. Some of them are red, right. Some of them right. are yellow. Do you think that has uh, some, some kind of a f effect on people wearing these at night? So they're blocking the bad light at night, but could they possibly be doing something else? I think if you use it as a tool, mm -hmm. which is for short-term use, like when you're sitting in front of your monitor at night and you know that the, the predominantly blue light coming from your screens uh, is going to disrupt your sleep and the release of melatonin, 
And the reason the pineal is called the regulator of regulators is because it impacts everything. It has a global effect. So when you start messing with melatonin, which is one of the body's most powerful hormones, you're impacting everything. So if you're using it for a specific purpose, for a certain amount of time, I don't think that is going to be problematic. I think that is the same common sense as um, if you're work, working on jewelry, you might use a jeweler's hammer, which is a very tiny little hammer. You don't use a sledgehammer. If you do, you destroy the thing, the jewelry. So the glasses are valuable for a purpose. When people start wearing them all the time, that's when you get that other impact that you mentioned about being in the pink room all the time. Gotcha. Any glasses that you're wearing all the time, especially ones that are, have filters on them or some coloration, is going to impact the spectrum of light that is being transmitted into the system. Especially sunglasses outside, huh? Yes. So you see sunglasses uh, were initially used solely by pilots because when they were flying those jets into the sun in the atmosphere could be blinding. So they used to have sunglasses that were called neutral gray. Neutral gray. Why is it neutral? It attenuates the spectrum equally all the way across. In other words, it diminishes the brightness but doesn't change the spectrum. <sighs> all right? And then people started using them for driving. And then it was cool because you look like a pilot. All the Air Force guys had that pilot <laughs> style glasses on. Then the industry began. And then, of course, if gray was cool, why not use green? Why not use pink? Why not look at the world through rose-colored glasses? Why not block some UV? Sudden, all of a sudden, it wasn't just a global attenuation of a pair of glasses only used to reduce the brightness level for certain activities, not all the time, for certain activities. The moment marketing came in <clears throat> and sunglasses became some sort of a status symbol, certain look, a certain color, then you something different is going on. You not only attenuate a certain portion of the spectrum, but you take the spectrum of sunlight which is nature's optimal fuel mix for life. It's the perfect octane for the human engine, the animal engine, the plant kingdom. It's designed after millions of years to be optimal for the development of that system. 98% it's estimated of the light that enters the body enters via the eyes. Now you put a pair of sunglasses on that not only blocks out the light because of the filters and the frame, but changes the spectrum. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you start getting a lower octane fuel. Well, you wanna know what the impact of that is? Take a car that requires high octane fuel and put regular gas in it. After a while, it'll start knocking. Then it develops residue in the engine. And then everything starts malfunctioning. So it's the same thing with the body. If the light spectrum is altered significantly from mother nature, it has global impact on your system. And because it occurs gradually, it's sort of like putting some sort of a creature in warm water that you then increase the heat on. 
it never notices that it's in the process of dying. Mm -hmm. So the same thing with, there's nothing wrong with glasses. It's a beautiful tool if you're entering, a, you know, driving into the sun or something. But when you start using them all the time, and now parents are putting sunglasses on babies whenever they go outside. That is not, that is robbing the child of their health. That is impacting that child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Anything you put, I mean, you cover up anything. You're wearing clothes every day too. And you're actually all those photoreceptors in your skin and you're blocking the light from that too. You know, the, this is a really important discussion because this topic of blue light mm -hmm. uh, is, is not new. Uh, a guy that I know rather well named Joe Sugarman many, many years ago before anyone knew about this, blue created a pair of sunglasses called blue blockers. <laughs> In fact, he gave me a pair, which I still have here. Oh, the aviator is nice. Right. Now, people were using these outside. And so when people think of blue light now, they think there's something wrong with blue light. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with blue light. The sun has an inordinate amount of blue light. It also has a very large amount of red light. They balance each other. Mm-hmm. One has one effect, the other one has a different effect. You need blue light. But the reason that we're speaking about blue light now is that our technology rarely replicates nature. You see, we think what's normal is what's natural and they're worlds apart. So we look at these monitors all day that the light sources, they look like everything is natural, but it's fooling your system. You think you're getting the whole spectrum of light, all portions, but you're just getting red, green, and blue with an inordinate amount of blue much, much greater than even the graphs show. And so what happens is it starts to impact your system because it is a source of light that is unnatural. So for instance, I'm looking at a 34 inch monitor right now. The monitor is against a wall and right there on the wall is a window. It's four feet by eight feet. What's coming in, you see your monitor, your window is behind you. My window is in front of me. It's behind the monitor. So I'm continually getting natural light other than the UV portion coming in, flooding my eyes, which I find is nourishing it also allows my eyes to continually escape. And because I live in Hawaii, there are no tall buildings where I live or any place on this island. So wherever I look, there's no confinement to my vision. I can see across the ocean. So there are things that we can do that naturally seem to offset or neutralize or diminish the impact of some of these these kinds of things and then of course you know we have all the different programs right now that diminish the you know that cause your screens to look more orangey and so on at night and so oh. on but the glasses are an important piece and i have pairs here that are darker orange and more yellow, depending mm -hmm. on whether you want to use them in the day or or the evening. But 
for me, because of my setup, I don't notice much of an impact. And I don't wear glasses of any type. So um, I sort of just enjoy the natural way right. that I see it. So, and that was a good point you made that if you're using a text screen or on a computer like we are right now, um, I've got windows in front of me too. You, you, you blend the light. You want to blend that light. Right. I've got, well, on me, I've got a spectrometer. Right. So people watching this right now to see exactly what you're talking about, if I just take uh, the, the, re the light right here, that's yeah. what it's like for people. So that's kind of a full spectrum. You know, the windows kind of cut some down. Yeah. And if I take, I'm going to do my computer screen right now for everybody watching. And even though it's got a, uh, it's not totally regular because it's got a, um, it's got a filter on it, but still right. now look at the computer screen, the light right. is spitting out. <clears throat> yeah. You can see the difference between real natural light and artificial light. Coming now, back. yeah, yeah. It, What's really interesting is that when you look at most of the screens, and is your does your screen have a program that's attenuating part of the blue right now? It, it I turned it off so I could see you better. So no. <laughs> okay. Um, it does. It does. Normally, it does. Because normally, when you look at those graphs, mm -hmm. the blue exceeds the graph. Oh. You, it, yeah, you know, it, mine's, got, it mine's got the night shift the graph. On. You're right. And, and that's the way the public was fooled all these years when they looked at full spectrum, what they called full spectrum light sources. The industry would literally fool around with the graphs. So it looked like the blue just ended with all the other colors, but... <laughs> what was really going on is that the blue was much bigger than the entire graph. Yes. Yes. goes off. But the public didn't, didn't see that. Uh huh. And, um, and all this technology makes a lot of noise. It, it makes a lot of vibratory noise, which the, also impacts your, your system. The, uh, are you referring to something like flicker? Yeah. Yeah. Not only the modulations, but and also the electromagnetics and, and the EMS. You know, yeah, there, there's so many different things. And so, but because this is part of our life, this is why it is so important, not only to have windows, but to spend, you know, some amount of time outdoors um, during the day. So that, because that's offsets all this. You know what? There was a great point in your book in light medicine of the future that you made that I, I don't see anyone talking about it today is you brought up Albertson Georgie and yeah. how um, certain enzymes in food and hormones in your body are sensitive to light and the light that you expose your food to and eat your food under right. actually can change um, how, they, how it works in your body. <clears throat> yeah, so, every physiological function is light dependent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you have an interest in blue light, but you must also be aware of what's happening with red and near infrared now. Right. And, and, and what the impact of all that is on the body. So, um, <laughs> Light is impacting everything in our system. And light is invisible. We, what we perceive is brightness. And we think the brightness is the light. The brightness is just a perceptual phenom phenomenon. The light itself is absolutely invisible. Cannot be seen or magnified or whatever. So, when uh, Jonathan Swift said, real vision is the ability to see the invisible, 
our cells are continually receiving guidance, information that is coherent and congruent with all that is. And that information is guiding all the cellular activity in the body. So to bring the body into a state of congruence, harmony with mother nature. In other words, the primary purpose of light is to bring us into a state of oneness with life. But of course, we've become an indoor culture. Mm. And we don't spend much time outdoors. And when we do spend time outdoors, you know, there's nothing wrong with sunscreens. But we think if we don't cover our body, something terrible is going to happen or covering our eyes or whatever. So what my suggestion is to people is to experiment. Don't believe what you read, don't believe what you hear, don't believe anything I tell you, but if something sounds interesting, do an experiment. So if you're a sunglass wearer, there's nothing wrong with sunglasses. Use them when you're driving into the sun or maybe if you're out fishing or maybe you're you're skiing or something like that. But spend some time outside your house, sitting in the shade, so there's not a direct sun, but you're in the light, and let your body adjust. If you live in a warm climate, go outside with minimal clothing and lay down and let the sunlight impinge the body, the, the top of the body, the front of the body for one minute and then turn over and do your backside for one minute. As much as possible, expose every part of your body if you're able. And then the next day, try it for a minute and a half or two minutes without sunscreens, without sunglasses, just very gradually build up your ability to be in the light, to allow the light to enter the body. Probably 15 or 20 minutes will give you an ample amount of vitamin D and many other things. But why I mentioned vitamin D is that most of the diseases of the culture, most of the diseases that are the result of lifestyle cancer, heart disease, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, diabetes are all inseparable from vitamin D. The more, the higher the vitamin D level, the less the incidence of those diseases. The lower the vitamin D level, the higher the incidence. They're all related to a vitamin D deficiency, which has really become a problem over the last 25 or 30 years when all the dermatologists were telling us to don't go outside without sunscreens and all the sunglass manufacturers and vision care people are saying you should be wearing sunglasses all the time. Nothing wrong with sunscreens, nothing wrong with sunglasses. There's a time and a place for everything. When you start using it across the board, you create terrible imbalances. So moderation is the key to everything. Moderation key, and um, and and also um, throughout the day, the spectral composition of light changes too. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Morning is going to be different than midday, and midday is going to be different than sun or set. Yeah. Um, so what, uh, there's a good guy out there in, in light, uh, his name's, you know him actually, you mentioned him in Luminous Life, Alexander Wunsch. Oh, he's a dear friend of mine. <laughs> he, he's got a great, um, uh, an experiment he did that showed how uh, a pretreatment with red light on the right. skin, um, reduces the um, erythema caused by UV light. Right. So it's a natural uh, progression of light early in the morning when the right. 
eyes is you're, there's no UV, there's lots of red light. That red light kind of pre treats your skin and preps it for the stronger light that comes out later in the day. It's a natural progression. Right. Like you're talking- You know that in 2017, the Nobel Prize in what they call physiology or medicine was won by three US scientists because they discovered the molecular basis of how our cells are continually adjusting their internal function to synchronize themselves with the changes of light happening in mother nature. In other words, throughout the day and night, our cells are continually um, modifying their function. Um, They are orchestrating their function in order to synchronize themselves with nature. The body is always receiving signals of light so that as nature changes, we meet it head on. I'll give you an example. I used to live in Aspen, Colorado. And during the summer months when it's warm, if you see a deer or a bear or someone, something out there, usually they have less hair. And uh, there's less hair because it's warmer and so on. But as you move through the summer and gradually move into the fall, their skin begins to thicken. Their hair begins to thicken because of the changes in the light. So then they fall asleep one night and when they wake up the next morning and there's the first snowfall, the bear never says, oh my God, I forgot to get my overcoat at Costco. (laughs) It meets the change exactly when it occurs because the body is continually changing in an inseparable way with mother nature. That's the way we're designed. That's called natural. What most of us experience, which is normal, is that our body is continually jet lagged. In other words, it's out of sync with mother nature's clock, even though we've never gone to the airport. Mm -hmm. Because we're not in nature. 95% of us are working and living indoors. We don't spend much time outdoors. And so what happens is our body cells lose a significant and their most important guidance system to keep us healthy and content. So it not only impacts the physiology the psychophysiology as well. So that so the the in other words, the, the bear has no control over his environment. He's he's the light programs his cells what right. to do, what, what to do. And and what people are doing now is we've taken over, we've taken control of our environment. We can turn night into day at the flick of a switch. Right. Bodies doesn't know what season it is because we've got Air conditioning, heating right. full time, and uh, it's just a big mess. Our <laughs> right, and and you see the result of that. Uh-huh. The result of that is that we not only have a higher incidence of disease than probably ever in our lifetime. Um, Our body is less able to handle the stresses of life, but we have more psycho-emotional imbalance than ever in history. Ever in history by a long shot for the reason you just mentioned. So mother nature entrains us into our natural state. Our everyday life entrains us into our normal state, 
Normal is not natural. It's nowhere near natural. Normal limits our longevity, increases our incidence of illness, and for most of us, robs us of contentment. So a key to good health, get back to nature as much as you can, as close as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, super important. Um, I like that. Um, what else do I have here on my list to talk to you about? Um, oh, I, I, one more thing in your, in your Luminous Life book was uh, in the wintertime. So, so speaking of progression and, and seasons in nature, it gets dark earlier. So when it gets dark earlier, and if, you've dunk, if you don't have the lights and the tech blaring, then you're, you start secreting melatonin earlier. Right. You get tired earlier. Right. Um, a lot of people have, they wake up. So they get tired earlier, but then they, they wake up in the middle of the night. I've, I used to, this used to happen to me. I get frustrated. Why am I waking up at night when in actuality it was, you know, because there was 14 hours of darkness, I was having a kind of a bicep phase sleep. Yeah. And I would get mad and, you know, oh, I'm, I can't believe this. And then I wouldn't be able to get back to sleep. But in your Luminous Life book, you had something called the uh, uh, one minute breath meditation. And anytime I get up now, I wake up at night, number one is I, I don't freak out about it. I just say, hey, woke up, big deal. And then I do your, your breath meditation and yeah. it, helps, it helps you go back to sleep pretty, pretty quickly. Um, the, the reason it helps go back to sleep is that when people meditate, <clears throat> they think it's about relaxation and quieting the mind and all these things. That's the superficial piece. The real purpose of meditation is to allow you to have a direct experience of the fact that you are not the activity of what's happening in the mind or the body. That you are that which notices that activity. So when the mind is active at night, when you awaken, the only reason you're aware of it is because you're observing it. The observer is not the mind that's chattering. The observer doesn't speak. It doesn't have thoughts. It doesn't have desires. It doesn't have preferences. It just notices. That noticer or that noticing is what is called consciousness. Consciousness is not one consciousness. Oh, you have a certain level of consciousness and the other person has a different level of consciousness. You know, we talk about consciousness. Oh, you should be more you should increase your consciousness and all that. That all sounds interesting, but it has nothing to do with consciousness. Consciousness is not an individual thing. Consciousness is a field of awareness. I call it the final set of eyes. It's the ocean of oneness that we, when we believe we're individuals, when we fall into it, we disappear as an individual and all that is, is a, a field of peace, a field of harmony, a field of oneness. There's a field of no problems and no solutions. Everything is clear and there's no questions. Now, people call that awakening, illumination, enlightenment, delightment, whatever you wanna call it. So when we begin to notice the body just expanding and contracting, what happens is the mind naturally quiets because whenever we start thinking, 
the breathing cycle is impacted. So the breathing gets compressed. But when you're just noticing the breath, the breath begins to become full and the mind begins to quiet. And so what happens is your center of gravity, your identity as you are your mind, your ideas, your beliefs, slips or shifts to another place that's noticing that activity but has no point of view. Because this field called consciousness has no point of view. It just notices. When the noticing occurs, you're no longer impacted by everything you think, everything in your beliefs. You, you are in a different dimension. And when that occurs, the system resets. It goes to a default setting. And so as you do these little one-minute experiences, your facility to identify with your essence becomes greater. And after a while, you begin to notice from that place of course, there's no you. There's just the noticing, and the noticing is guiding you, not your thoughts. There's no concept of choice here or having to figure it out. It literally comes free of charge. So at night, or whenever you do these, after a while, they transform something inside and everything in your life begins to be different. Yeah. <laughs> My sleep certainly improved. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, this has been great. Thank you very much for doing this. Sure, uh, my pleasure. Is there any, any new projects you're working on or anything you want to talk about at the end here? Um, I am... Uh, I've been developing a, a new vision product that integrates vision training and photobiomodulation, which is the use of red and near infrared, wow. to retrain and restore the eyes. So that's something that's in the works. Uh, it's it's not just an idea. We've already built a prototype and. Uh, so that's in the works. And I'm also working on a proposal now for uh, an incredible light-based system that will eval evaluate your receptivity to the different portions of the spectrum, see how that impacts your bio field, the field of energy uh, measured uh, in very scientific ways uh, and then utilizing light to see if we can uh, expand your ability to ingest the portions of the spectrum that you have not been able to ingest and to see how that impacts your biofield and overall health. <laughs> Sign me. <It's> <laughs> entirely new way of looking at the human energy system, uh, not looking at it in terms of its diseases and all of that, but looking at it in terms of its receptivity to light and what happens when that receptivity uh, changes. Wow, and in the, is there, the, the system you use to, to uh, uh, check your biofield, I think that was a Roland Van Vick, Wick book? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Roland Van Vick, uh, who photons. Yeah, is also a friend. Oh, you uh, know. Yeah, I've been to his laboratory uh, in the Netherlands. Um, his work um, uh, was uh, catalyzed by the work of Fritz Pop, who has now passed away. Um, but uh, Roland and his son, Edward, 
uh, work with biophotons. Um, and they are working with it in a certain way in a laboratory. There's another way of also looking at the emanation of energy and interaction of light in the body. And that is with gas discharge visualization, which is a different uh, technique, um, but looks at something similar. And that's what we're gonna be using. Very cool. I like it. And people go to your website. It's Jacob, jacoblieberman.org. Exactly. You have a, um, a newsletter or, or something like that? Yeah. If, if people want to sign up for that, we can, we will send them that when we do newsletters. Uh, my, our site is not a marketing site. We're not, uh, it's not one of those things that is all about, uh, uh, selling you things. And so it's more of an informational site. And so is our, our, our Facebook page. It's just about continually putting out things that we think are beneficial for people and, and uh, can help people live a better life and smile more. I love your Facebook page. Lots of, lots of good posts coming off that. Page. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Jacob, thank you very much for joining me. This, this has been awesome. Have a wonderful day and thank you again for uh, setting this up. This was a pleasure.